Japan storms through Siberia, Russian landing forces crushed, Putin heeds in bunker, U.S.-Japan strategy shakes Asia and Africa, Russia turns into a global missile showroom. Hello, everyone. Today, let's dive into Putin's little schemes and Japan's big moves. Let's see what new annex these old adversaries have come up with. On the Ukraine front, Western countries are sending high-tech weapons one after another. The White House is even ready to loosen the reins, allowing Ukraine to use missiles against Russian territory. Seeing the situation turning sour, Putin starts flipping out diplomatically and doesn't waste any time militarily. He quickly ropes in his Chinese buddies for a joint military exercise in the Sea of Japan. Clearly, this isn't aimed at Ukraine, but is a show for Japan and its allies if Japan keeps sprinting down the path of aiding Ukraine. China and Russia wouldn't mind giving you a little knock on your door. The protracted Ukraine war is largely because Western weapon production can't keep up with the demand. Russia, on the other hand, with China's logistical support, hasn't been short on resources or weapons and has managed to withstand the pressure. But the West still has a trump card, Japan. Japan's military-industrial strength is nothing to sneeze at. They can run at full capacity without any issues. However, their post-WWII peace constitution ties their hands, temporarily preventing them from directly sending weapons to Ukraine. But if Japan ever tears up that constitution and starts providing military aid, it would be a game changer. Their technology and production capacity could turn the tide at any moment. And that's exactly what worries Russia the most. Currently, Japan can only offer economic and material assistance, but don't underestimate them. By February, Japan's aid had already reached $10 billion with a promise to add another $12 billion. This scale surpasses Germany's, tightening Putin's frown even more. And these funds come with no strings attached. Ukraine can spend the money as it pleases, potentially boosting its own military production significantly. Tokyo has also given their domestic companies the green light to invest in Ukraine. In February, Japan and Ukraine signed a bilateral investment treaty covering things like double taxation and low-interest loans. Essentially, Japan is laying the economic groundwork for Ukraine, ensuring it has a path to recovery post-war. Watching all this, Putin is probably seething. Even more interestingly, in July, Japan struck a $90 million deal with the U.S. For Patriot missiles, on the surface, it's to help the U.S., replenish its stockpiles, but where these missiles end up depends on Washington's decisions. They might go to Taiwan or Israel. Wherever they're deployed, it throws a wrench into China and Russia's plans. Russia is watching this closely, fearing these missiles might just drop from the sky one day. One day when the UC Patriot missiles might run out, Japan's own missiles could step in. Putin is under immense pressure, and the Russian foreign ministry has already stated that if Japan's Patriot missiles make an appearance on the Ukrainian battlefield, there will be no talks between Japan and Russia. Honestly, relations between Japan and Russia are already so tense they're on the brink of collapse. How bad could they get? Is Putin seriously considering invading Japan? Believe it or not, Putin might actually entertain that idea. Look at the joint military exercises with China in the Sea of Japan. They're clearly aimed at Japan sending the message, don't mess with Ukraine. Or we'll be knocking on your doorstep naturally, Japan won't ignore this signal, but whether such a tough stance will work remains to be seen. This round of military exercises has, in fact, strengthened U.-Japan relations even further, which isn't what Putin intended. He probably just wanted to scare them a bit, but if Japan really amends its constitution and lifts military restrictions, the situation could become something Russia never wanted to see. Speaking of which, let's take a moment here. Some might ask, does Russia really dare to take action against Japan? Let's think about it. Russia's naval and air force capabilities compared to Japan's aren't exactly in their favor. Russia's Pacific fleet doesn't boast many large warships and their shipbuilding capabilities are limited. Since the Soviet Union collapsed, the Russian Navy has been declining, struggling even to build large destroyers, settling for 4,000-ton boats instead. In contrast, Japan's naval and air power are top-notch globally with over 100 F-35 fighter jets and no shortage of submarines and destroyers not to mention Japan's world-class submarines and anti-submarine capabilities, which make underwater operations a nightmare for Russia. If a fight broke out in the Sea of Japan, Russia wouldn't necessarily have the upper hand. On the air front, Russia's Su-57 fleet is limited, relying mainly on Su-30s and Su-35s. Japan, however, has a vast number of F-35s with highly skilled pilots. The F-35 stealth and advanced electronics would give the Russian Air Force a tough time. Plus, Russia's supply lines across the strait are virtually unmanageable. Let's not forget the U.S.A.S. always lurking nearby. If Russia moves against Japan, the U.S.S.-Japan alliance won't just sit back. Russia would truly find itself backed into a corner, struggling on multiple fronts. But think about it, Russia is already stumbling in Ukraine. How could it possibly handle Japan and the U.S. simultaneously in the Far East? And what if Putin actually uses nuclear weapons? That would be playing with fire on a global stage, digging a hole for himself. Once nuclear weapons are used, Russia would turn into a showroom for missiles from every nation. So Putin is mostly bluffing Japan, isn't foolish, and will continue doing what it needs to do. 
In March this year, Kishida, as the G7 chair, personally visited Kiev to ensure that the international community remained focused on the Ukraine situation, which made him the first Japanese leader since WDII to visit an active conflict zone. This wartime visit marked a significant shift in Japan's diplomatic traditions. Previously, Japan had been on the sidelines, but now it's standing on the front lines. Through Kishida, Japan not only expressed support for Ukraine, but also helped Ukraine rally representatives from India, the African Union, and ASEAN, securing broader international backing. The Japanese are typically low-key, but excel at making substantial moves that target Russia's vulnerabilities. For example, at the Japan-Ukraine Economic Revitalization Promotion Conference in Tokyo this February, both sides discussed a new investment treaty, paving the way for Japanese companies to invest in Ukraine. Various tax incentives and visa conveniences were neatly arranged. Essentially, Japan is all set to pour significant funds into Ukraine, giving Putin a painful eye-opener. Even more impressively, Japan pledged a $1.35 billion support plan. This isn't just ordinary investment, it's a strategic move aimed at post-war economic recovery with high expectations. In the future, this $1.35 billion could even double, almost guaranteeing Ukraine's survival through the war. Watching all this, Putin must be fuming these small moves are precisely Japan's version of a diplomatic dagger. Tokyo's primary mission has shifted from building a partnership with Russia to ensuring Ukraine's victory. Such a transformation was unimaginable during Abe Shinzo's era. Back in the 2010s, Japan and Russia's relationship wasn't this strained. Under Abe's administration, the two countries occasionally discussed cooperation over the Northern Northern Territories issue, and Russia was open to Japanese investments in the Far East. Unfortunately, Abe's diplomatic efforts were ultimately derailed by Putin's military actions. In 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea, the Abe government cautiously maintained economic cooperation, only verbally condemning the move since Japan still hoped to resolve the Northern Territories issue through negotiation. Even as Russia increased its military presence on the Northern Territories, Japan remained unwilling to completely break ties. However, the 2022 Russia-Ukraine war shattered that illusion. The G7 nations finally realized that Russia and China were growing closer and Japan had to face reality these neighboring countries had never had Japan's best interests at heart. Japan fully sided with the Western countries. In March 2022, Japan swiftly adjusted its policies toward Russia, ending Russia's most favored nation status, freezing assets, cutting off economic cooperation, and imposing sanctions on Putin and several of his top officials. These actions were a solid lesson for Russia. Abe's assassination in July 2022 dealt a severe blow to Putin's biggest Japanese friend, the older pro-Russian figures like Yukio Haruyama and Yoshiro Mori, gradually faded from Japan's political core due to age. The pro-Russian stance of Abe's era ended with the rise of a new generation of politicians. Putin's influence over Japan dwindled, making the restoration of Russia-Japan relations almost impossible. In June 2024, Putin even signed a mutual defense agreement with North Korea, signaling his abandonment of repairing relations with Japan. For Japan, this was another sign of Russia further militarizing the Northern Territories and allying with China. After all, North Korea is also Japan's top threat in the Indo-Pacific and poses a hidden threat to Japan's ally, South Korea. Back to Japan's military strength. Japan is now preparing to lift military restrictions, shedding the post-WWII handcuffs of its peace constitution. Domestic support for these policies is high. In March 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine a month later, polls showed that 77% of Japanese people believe the international community must unite to stop Russia's expansion. They fear that if Russia is allowed to take over Ukraine, the next move might be China targeting Taiwan. Currently, Japan plans to increase its defense budget to 2% of GDP with the 2024 defense budget, reaching a record $55.9 billion, set to rise to $62.5 billion by 2027. If military restrictions are lifted, this budget could continue to grow, meaning Japan's military spending will far exceed these small targets. If restrictions are indeed lifted, Japan could heavily invest in advanced weapons development and procurement. Cruise missiles, fifth-generation fighter jets, and top-tier air defense systems could all be on the table. Once these weapons are operational, they could directly threaten China and Russia's strategic vulnerabilities. In July this year, the USS and Japan held a 2-2 security meeting and decided to establish a joint command center in Tokyo by the end of the year. The goal is straightforward, address issues with long command chains during emergencies. Currently, U.S. forces in Japan handle daily operations, but major decisions come from Hawaii. Once the Joint Command Center is up, U.S., and Japanese forces can coordinate directly in Tokyo, ensuring faster information flow. If China or Russia ever moves against Japan, this Joint Command Center would be on the front lines. The U.S. has always viewed Japan as the leading big brother in its Indo-Pacific strategy, especially in East and Southeast Asia. According to USES, plans 
Japan would extend from its home base all the way to the South Pacific, covering the Ryukyu Islands, Taiwan, the Philippines, and more, while also partnering with countries like Australia to ensure American influence in Southeast Asia. The U.S. isn't just eyeing East Asia, it's also considering making Japan active in South Asia, the Middle East, and even Africa. Don't underestimate this plan if Japan truly intervenes in these regions, expanding influence for China and Russia becomes a lot harder. After all, the U.S. strategy is to have Japan do more legwork, allowing the U.C. to focus on other areas. Japan's moves have also forced China and Russia to reassess their strategies. If Japan completely lifts its military restrictions, the future Indo-Pacific landscape will become even more complex. Putin might still be pondering how pulling in China to scare Japan backfired, pushing Japan closer to the U.S. The future chessboard is just getting started. In summary, since the Ukraine war began, Japan has quietly executed a major diplomatic and military overhaul. From Abe's cautious approach to Kishida's decisive actions, Putin is now genuinely at a loss. For China and Russia, Japan's rise is a challenge that cannot be ignored. That's all for today. It looks like Putin's master plan might be falling apart and Japan's low-key approach isn't just talk. The future of international power plays is bound to get even more exciting. Let's stay tuned. See you next time.